Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 39 through 41. Listen to a talk given by a tour guide. Welcome to Everglades National Park. The Everglades is a watery plain covered with sawgrass that's home to numerous species of plants and wildlife. At one and a half million acres, it's too big to see it all today. But this tour will offer you a good sampling. Our tour bus will stop first at Taylor Slough. This is a good place to start because it's home to many of the plants and animals typically associated with the Everglades. You'll see many exotic birds and, of course, our world-famous alligators. Don't worry, there's a boardwalk that goes across the marsh so you can look down at the animals in the water from a safe distance. The boardwalk is high enough to give you a great view of the sawgrass prairie. From there, we'll head to some other marshy and even jungle-like areas that feature wonderful tropical plant life. For those of you who'd like a closer view of the sawgrass prairie, you might consider renting a canoe sometime during your visit here. However, don't do this unless you have a very good sense of direction and can negotiate your way through tall grass. We'd hate to have to come looking for you. You have the good fortune of being here in the winter, the best time of year to visit. During the spring and summer, the mosquitoes will just about eat you alive. Right now, they're not so bothersome, but you'll still want to use an insect repellent. Number 39. What is the main purpose of the tour? Number 40. What does the speaker imply about paddling across the water in a canoe? Number 41. Why is it good to visit the Everglades in the winter? Questions 42 through 46. Listen to a talk given by an astronaut. Thank you. It's great to see so many of you interested in this series on survival in outer space. Please excuse the cameras. We're being videotaped for the local TV stations. Tonight I'm going to talk about the most basic aspect of survival the space suit. When most of you imagine an astronaut, that's probably the first thing that comes to mind, right? Well, without space suits, it would not be possible for us to survive in space. For example, outer space is a vacuum. There's no gravity or air pressure. Without protection, a body would explode. What's more, we'd cook in the sun or freeze in the shade, with temperatures ranging from a toasty 300 degrees above to a cool 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The space suit that NASA has developed is truly a marvel. This photo enlargement here is a life-size image of an actual space suit worn by astronauts on the last space shuttle mission. This part is the torso. It's made of seven extremely durable layers. This thick insulation protects against temperature extremes and radiation. Next is what they call a bladder of oxygen. That's an inflatable sac filled with oxygen to simulate atmospheric pressure. This bladder presses against the body with the same force as the Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The innermost layers provide liquid cooling and ventilation. Despite all the layers, the suit is flexible, allowing free movement so we can work. Another really sophisticated part of the space suit is the helmet. I brought one along to show you. Can I have a volunteer come and demonstrate? Number 42. What is the speaker's main purpose? Number 43. 
What would cause an unprotected human body to explode in outer space? Number 44. Where is the bladder of oxygen located? Number 45. What does the speaker show the audience as she describes the main part of the spacesuit? Number 46. What will probably happen next? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to a talk about a program sponsored by a student organization. Good evening. My name is Pam Jones, and on behalf of the Modern Dance Club, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. The club is pleased to present the TV version of The Catherine Wheel, Twyla Tharp's rock ballet. This video version of the ballet has been even more successful with audiences than the original theater production. It includes some animation, slow motion, and stop-action freezes that really help the audience understand the dance. The title of the piece refers to St. Catherine, who died on a wheel in 307 A.D. Nowadays, a Catherine wheel is also a kind of firework. It looks something like a pinwheel. Anyway, the dance is certainly full of fireworks. You'll see how Twyla Tharp explores one family's attempt to confront the violence in modern life. The central symbol of the work is a pineapple, but exactly what it represents has always created a lot of controversy. As you watch, see if you can figure it out. The music for this piece is full of the rhythmic energy of rock music. It was composed by David Byrne of the rock band Talking Heads, and the lead dancer in this version was Sarah Rudner, who is perfectly suited to Tharp's adventurous choreography. Following the video, dance teacher Mary Parker will lead a discussion about the symbolism Miss Tharp used. We hope you can stay for that. So, enjoy tonight's video, and thank you for your support. Number 47. What is the purpose of the talk? Number 48. Why was the video version of the dance more successful than the theater production? Number 49. What kind of music is the dance performed to? Number 50. What will probably be included in the discussion after the program? This is the end.